Batman was created by a gun. It only stands to reason that after seeing your parents murdered by a gun, you're going to adopt a strong stance on them. And for young Bruce Wayne, it was opposition. Bruce's aversion to firearms has been handled in many ways depending on the writer and situation, from being portrayed as an accomplished marksman with a mere ideological disagreement, to suffering from a kind of phobia, to out-and-out -out anger. It's no secret that this hasn't always been the case. When Batman was first introduced in the pages of Detective Comics, he was depicted as brandishing handguns and was far more cavalier about killing, or at least talking about it. This led to a common misconception that this gun-toting, bloodthirsty Batman was not only shooting criminals, but that this was the character's original intent, and these elements were removed due to censorship. They didn't really know what they had, Batman writer and editor Denny O'Neill said of the early gun-toting. The character was very much in an intensive evolution mode for about that first year, and it's right and proper that that be. One of the reasons the character has lasted is that he's changed with the times. The truth is, much like how nearly all bands start out by playing cover songs, with only one previous superhero to draw from, Finger and Kane were deeply influenced by the pulp novel heroes of the 20s and 30s. Far and away their biggest influence was The Shadow, a dark mysterious vigilante brandishing twin 45 handguns. Finger and Kane's new character Batman shared a shocking number of similarities before coming into his own, but essentially started out as a cover version of The Shadow. Many instances of Batman with a gun were merely in keeping with that aesthetic, and the gun didn't actually enter into the story at all. Despite several illustrations of Batman holding guns, and posing with guns, there are only two instances in those early days of Batman actually firing a gun at anyone. Here he cautiously uses it to set off an explosion, and here he uses it to draw the attention of the police. And here he professes to wanting to just wing an assailant. The first actual gun firing is the conclusion of Detective Comics number 32, where 1930 SPOILER! Batman shoots a pair of sleeping vampires. Only, traditionally, vampires don't die from bullets. That's werewolves. Thus, we can assume that they survived and Batman keeps his clean gun kill record. At least until he got his own book. In this page, from Batman number one, Batman uses an airplane-mounted machine gun to fire on a truck full of bad guys. And just in case it was unclear what he was doing, he remarks, Much as I hate to take human life, I'm afraid this time it's necessary. Batman's brandishing of guns and talk of killing ended in 1940 with an editorial rule that banned both, just after the release of Batman No. 4, about 20 or so issues into the character's run in Detective Comics. Speaking on the subject, former DC publisher and writer Paul Levitz called the editorial rule an important development in separating Batman as a superhero from the pulp traditions of characters like The Shadow who use guns as freely as the villains in their stories. This began to be reinforced in the comics, like this panel from Batman number 7 where Commissioner Gordon defends Batman and Robin, or later in this letters column when a reader asks about gun use. It should be noted that this was an in-house decision made by DC, some 14 years before Frederick Wortham's Seduction of the Innocent was published and the subsequent establishment of the Comics Code Authority in 1954. These new industry-wide standards of censorship put into place by the Comics Code would lead Batman into a more far-fetched sci-fi direction in the late 50s, leading to the 60s camp television show with Adam West and sending the character perhaps the furthest from the shadow-inspired, gritty urban crime fighter that he ever would be. These rules didn't prohibit other characters from gun use, of course, and issues featured a ton of gunplay, just not from Batman. Like this bizarre example from Detective Number 41, where an enemy shoots himself in the head before he could get captured by a shockingly disdainful Batman and the newly introduced Robin. The concept of Batman being forced to take up arms as a last and final resort has come up a few times in subsequent issues, but it was always some sort of red herring or clever workaround. Like in this issue where Batman's shotgun is revealed to merely be a camera shotgun. Although, I don't think that was just a camera when he plays Russian Roulette a few issues later. Once he used a shotgun to fire on hypnotized, bomb-carrying dolphins. But I digress. Then, in 1985, the first of DC's reset events happened, Crisis on Infinite Earths, and with it, something of a clean slate for their characters in a move towards clearing up continuity issues, modernizing characters, and unifying the DC universe. This resulted in the essential Batman Year One by Frank Miller and Dave Mazzuchelli in the pages of Batman. Eager to map out Batman's new history, DC originally slated another story of Batman's formative years to run parallel to Year One in the pages of Detective, based off of a treatment by Mike W. Barr titled Batman 1980. It was later rescheduled as a sequel of sorts to Year One and retitled Year Two. After being bested by the Reaper, Gotham's first vigilante crime finder back after a lengthy hiatus, Bruce again reconsiders his stance on firearms. 
Only this time, he casually reaches into a drawer in his study and produces the gun that Joe Chill used to kill his parents, which he apparently stole from the crime scene as a bereaved child and has been keeping this whole time. WTF indeed, Bat fans. But that's maybe the third craziest thing that happens in this story. He later aligns himself with organized crime in an effort to defeat the Reaper, which leads him to team up buddy cop style with a murderous Joe Chill. I won't spoil the ending, but needless to say, the very next continuity fixing reset event, 1994's Zero Hour, struck this story from the record. Year two is the best kind of crazy. As out of character and just flat out bad as some of the ideas presented are, you can't help but respect a story that swings for the fences so hard and sustains four issues almost entirely on subverting expectations. It reads a lot like early Hollywood adaptations of comics, where certain elements were presented, but the finer details are lacking, ignored, or changed. The clean slate afforded by the transfer to new media is similar to the clean slate afforded to Mike W. Barr with Year 2. This was three years before Sam Hamm would introduce an arguably just as many changes to the Dark Knight lore in Tim Burton's Batman film without any of the scorn that has been levied against Year 2. The question of Year 2's story working as a film was answered when portions of it were repurposed for the animated Mask of the Phantasm feature film. In the climax to Grant Morrison's 2009 Final Crisis, Batman makes a once-in-a-lifetime exception to his gun policy, using a gun to shoot a god-killing bullet at Darkseid. Whether this is a deviation from Batman's character sort of depends on whether or not you're on board with the story. With 2016's release of Zack Snyder's Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice unleashing a newer interpretation of Batman onto the screens, the topic of Batman killing, and specifically his use of guns, came back into discussion. BVS sees a more brutal version of Batman to be certain, but for some, his violence crossed the line for the character. During a press junket for his film, Snyder explained his decision by citing a particular scene in Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. In the Frank Miller comic book that I reference, he kills all the time. There's a scene in the graphic novels where he busts through the wall and grabs the guy's machine gun. I took that little vignette from a scene in The Dark Knight Returns. At the end of that, he shoots the guy right between the eyes with the machine gun. One shot. Right. Only he doesn't do that. At all. At best, the panel is ambiguous, with most interpretations being that Batman shoots around the mutant to startle them into dropping the baby. In the animated film, Batman fires a gun out of the mutant's hand. The animated series version of this scene avoided Batman's use of the mutant's gun altogether. But either way, right between the eyes is just false. As is kills all the time. Reading The Dark Knight Returns thinking Batman is killing left and right represents a fundamental misunderstanding of the character for many reasons, chief among them being it would completely negate the whole point of Batman's final confrontation with the Joker. Batman's anti-gun stance really couldn't be made any more clear in the pages of that comic. Miller is even quoted in Batman A Complete History saying that Batman doesn't actually kill people, and since the release of Batman v Superman has been uncharacteristically democratic in his comments on the film and his use of his work as an influence, stating simply, I'll just say, thanks. What can I say? No, actually, I'll withdraw that. I'll say, you're welcome. We're going to leave it there. For more on Batman and guns, please check out some of the source links in the show notes. If you liked the video, please tell your friends who like Batman. Like, rate, subscribe, share, and as always, support your local comic shop. We'll see you next time. Much as I hate to take human life, I'm afraid this time it's necessary.